With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. It is Monday, July the 18th, year of our Lord 2022. I am Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us here on Herd Tell. This is going to be a different kind of program than we normally do. The Uvalde school shooting, Rob Elementary, the preliminary report has been released. We have it uh, from the Texas legislature where they have done their preliminary investigation into the massacre that happened there. We have the report. We're going to read from it verbatim today. We have been highly critical of the response there. We've had a lot of questions of the police. We've had a lot of questions of the response, the investigation. We have been harsh. So we're going to read this report verbatim to you, and you can decide. We're also going to link to it. We encourage you to read the full report for yourself. So that's what we're going to take the bulk of our time up doing today. We talk about all the time. We're going to turn down the noise. We're going to get to the information. Well, this is the information. We're not going to just surmise it. We're not going to do the talking head thing where we tell you what is in it. We're going to read it to you word for word. Now, some of this obviously is going to be a little graphic. Some of this could be triggering to some folks for certain reasons, but this is all going to be right out of the report as we read it. Um, we're going to pick it up about 56 pages into it uh, as the PDF reads. We're going to start with Chief Arendado. Uh, who was chief of the Consolidated Independent School District Police and was nominally should have been in charge and has taken the blunt of the criticism, including from us. Uh, in the meantime, since this has happened, he has resigned from the city council seat he was uh, elected to in the meantime, and he has also been put on administrative leave by the mayor of the city. We will deal with all that later, but right now we're going to just read from the report. We're going to start this is after the shooter's already been in the building. We're going to have to skip ahead a little bit, but there's two important things that we think we need to cover based on our criticism, based on what we understand of the situation here. We're going to start with Chief Arendando's uh, response here. Then we're going to talk about the response of some of the other police in here, and then we're going to read what the report said, and it's headlined this way, what didn't happen that probably should have. So let's pick it up and start with this very special edition of Herd Tell. I know this is going to be different. This is going to be a lot of raw data and information, but we think it's important enough that we're going to take the time to do it. Here we go. Uh, page 56. If you're on the PDF version, you can find this at ordinary-times.com. Lots of other places are carrying it as well. Please read the entire document yourself. You owe it to those kids and the situation to know what happened before you go off opining on the internet. That includes us. So we have read the entire document, and here's what it says. Um, picking it up, uh, Chief Arendando's testimony about his immediate perception of the circumstances is consistent with that of the responders to the extent that they uniformly testified they were unaware of what was taking place behind the doors of room 111 and 112. Those are the rooms that the, the uh, shooter is barricaded in. They obviously were in a school building during school hours, and the attacker had fired a large number of rounds from inside the rooms. But the responders testified they heard no screams or cries from within the rooms, and they did not know whether anyone was trapped inside needing rescue or medical attention. Not seeing any injured students during their initial foray into the hallway, Sergeant Coronado testified Heath's thoughts was that there was probably a quote-unquote bailout situation. Chief Arendando and the officers contended they were justified in treating the attacker as a barricaded subject rather than as an active shooter, because of the lack of visual confirmation of the injuries or other information, Chief Arendando explained his reaction for not continuing an active shooter-style response, telling the committee, this is a quote from Arendando now, when there's a threat, you have to visibly be able to see the threat. You have to have a target before you engage your firearm. That was just something that goes through your head a million times, getting fired at through a wall, coming from behind a blind wall. I had no idea what was on the other side of that wall, but you eliminate the threat where you could see it. I never saw a threat. I never got to physically see the threat of the shooter. That's a quote. Back to the report. The barricaded subject approach never changed over the course of the incident, despite evidence that Chief Arendando's perception evolved to a later understanding that the fatalities and injuries were within the classroom were a very strong probability. 
He effectively conceded his error when he asked what he should have done differently had he known the injured victims were in the classroom. Chief Arndondo responded to the committee, I guess if I knew there was somebody in there, I would have, we probably would have rallied a little more to say, okay, somebody is in there. That's a quote. Chief Arndondo went to room 109, found it locked and dark, saw a child's head, and realized there were students in that room. Officers Gonzalez asked Chief Arndondo if he wanted to activate the SWAT team, which he confirmed to Gonzalez, then stepped out to make the call. As mentioned earlier, however, the head of the SWAT for Uvalde Police was already in the building. Chief Arndondo then used his mobile phone to call the Uvalde Police Department. The Department of Public Safety supplied the following transcription of this call. These are quotes. Hey, hey, it's Arndondo. It's Arndondo. Can you hear me? No, I have to tell you where we are at. It's an emergency right now. I'm inside the building. I'm and the dispatcher has some crosstalk here. Arndondo, is the teacher with him? Is the teacher with him? Is the teacher with him? Is she in the same room as him? Can you hear me, ma'am? Uh, the dispatcher says I'm right here. Ma'am, is the teacher with him? Is he in the classroom? She's in another classroom. She's in 102. Another person probably across from her. Arndondo, of course, okay, we hear him. He's in the room. He's got an AR-15, and he's shot a lot. He's in the room. He hasn't come out yet. We're surrounded, but I don't have a radio. Dispatcher confirms the SWAT location now, and then Arndondo replies, yes, and they need to be outside of the building prepared because we don't have enough firepower right now. All we have is pistols, and he has an AR-15. Dispatcher asks if you want to stay on the phone with me as long as you can. I am, but I'm going to drop it when he comes out of the doors again, all right? The dispatcher over says that 401 has a shooter in 111 or 112. Those are the classrooms he was in. He was going to be armed with a rifle. He repeats a request for SWAT by the funeral home, which is outside an adjacent building. So, so I need you to bring a radio for me and give me my radio for me. I need to get one rifle. Hold on. I'm trying to set him up. I'm trying to set him up. This is a transcript from the 911 call. Now the committee report continues. By 1142, Constable Johnny Field has arrived on the north end of the hallway. Constable Field saw Chief Arndondo on the other end and held up his phone. Chief Arndondo called and began communicating with him by phone as the primary contact on the north end. They discussed the need to evacuate the children from the building, and Chief Arndondo decides to accomplish that by breaking windows. Officers Gonzalez and Page proceed to start breaking classroom windows and helping to evacuate students from the classroom. Chief Arndondo found another unlocked classroom on the east side of the hallway with a teacher and students locked inside, and he told them to stay down. Meanwhile, Sergeant Coronado had exited the building through the south door and made his own report by radio. He requested shields and flashbangs from the police department, and he asked for helicopter support and ballistic shields from the Department of Public Safety. Agreeing with Chief Arandondo's assessment, he reported the shooter was contained, that's in quotes, inside the building and barricaded in one of the offices. Dispatch asked Sergeant Coronado if the classroom doors were locked. He responded he was not sure, but they had a Halligan tool to break it. Radio traffic indicated the attacker was in Mrs. Morales' classroom, that's room 112 and asked whether the students were inside. In response, Sergeant Coronado requested a mirror to look around quarters. A voice on the radio replied that the class should be in session. After the initial responders took fire from the attacker, Sergeant Coronado remained outside the building on the southwest side for a total of approximately 30 minutes, regularly advising other officers to be careful about potential crossfire or a fatal funnel in the hallway and assisting the evacuation of students and teachers through the windows on the west side of the building. When some newly arrived responders appeared to suggest that the officers should clear out of the south side because the United States Border Patrol Tactical Unit, the BORTAC team, that's the special team that ended up actually taking the shooters down at the end, responders were operating on the opposite end. Sergeant Coronado responded, the chief is in there and the chief is in charge right now, meaning Arandondo, suggesting both that Chief Arandondo was in control and in communication with the other side of the building, which we now know he was not. While Sergeant Coronado was outside, his body camera recorded several people commenting on the need to find a master key to the classrooms. Once Sergeant Coronado returned inside the south side of the hallway, he found Chief Arandondo on his phone also asking for a key, which was a primary focus of his intention for the next 40 minutes. Chief Arandondo personally tried all of one large set of keys brought to him 
And when Sergeant Coronado cautioned him to stay clear of the hallway and the fatal funnel, Chief Arandondo responded, just tell him to F and wait. Much of this time was spent by Chief Arandondo on the phone with Constable Field. He made issued a series of additional requests for equipment and support, including snipers, a master key, and breaching tools, repeatedly referencing the need for a key and breaching tools before they could attempt to enter the classroom with the attacker. While waiting, he also periodically attempted to communicate with the attacker in English and Spanish, including immediately after the four shots were fired from inside the classroom at 12.21 p.m. Despite all the discussion of breaching tools, Captain Chief Arandondo testified no one made him aware when one arrived in the building. Chief Arandondo prioritized making certain all the classrooms of the building were clear to the teachers and students, including evacuating room 109, where the attackers had shot Miss Avelia through the walls. In the context of this evacuation, Chief Arandondo responded that, quote, people are going to ask why we took so long, end quote. And in apparent reference to the ongoing evacuation that they were trying to case of, quote, the rest of the lives first. In addition to seeking keys and breaching tools, the other predominant theme of the south side of the building was waiting for the bore tack to breach the classroom. Chief Orondondo discussed with Constable Field various means of attempting the breach, such by using a sniper or flashback to kill, the dis- kill or distract the attacker. Beginning at 1230, various officers entered the south doors and walked by Chief Arandondo and Sergeant Coronado, stacking up south of room 111 and 112 and on the west side of the hallway, anticipating a move to breach the classroom. At 1245, somebody commented that the ranger had a set of keys that was being tested, and finally at 1250, a team of officers made entry into the classroom and killed the attacker, which officers stationed on the south side of the port hallway quickly falling in behind them and entering rooms 111 and 112. Chief Arandondo testified that the only direction he gave to this north side of the building through Constable Field was that for them to evade the kids and to test the keys before trying to go in the classroom with the attackers. He said he did not make any decision for Bortak to breach the classroom. That's what happened with Chief Arandondo. We're going to talk about what happened on the north side of the building. That's where they actually did stuff and got into the classroom. And then we're going to deal with what didn't happen in another section of this report. More from the Uvalde school shooting Rob Elementary report on her tell verbatim, reading it straight to you, unfiltered, for you to make up your own mind right after this. Welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. We are continuing to read from the Rob Elementary uh, report that the Texas Legislature Special Committee has assigned. That's the Uvalde school shooting, the massacre that occurred there regarding the police response there. We are reading it verbatim, unfiltered and without commentary. We're just reading the report directly to you, some of the uh, most important parts of it. Now, it's a large report. We have linked to it at ordinary-times.com. Please read the entire thing, not just our little section of it. We just talked about Chief Arndondo, which has come under a lot of criticism, including from us. We've just read a portion about what he did. This is now a section on what was going on to the north side of the building or the opposite side from where Chief Arndondo was. Rewinding the clock, this is from the report verbatim. We're just reading it straight to you. Rewinding the clock to the point at which the attackers shot at the initial responders in the building, there were three Uvalde police officers who led the way down the hallway from the north side of the building. Lieutenant Martinez, followed by Sergeant Canales, followed by Officer Landry. Building fragments hit Lieutenant Martinez and Sergeant Canales as the attackers shot into the hallway, and all three officers retreated to the north end. By the way, this is the video that was released. That's the north end. That's what you see where they come back down the hallway, and then the stuff that happens after that. As Sergeant Canales ran out, his body camera documented the presence of multiple officers in the north hallway and a Department of Public Safety trooper stationed at the door as he exited to the west. Sergeant Canales reported, quote, we got to get in there, and he made a phone call requesting more help. Uvalde police officer Landry, who had been third in the line on the north side behind Lieutenant Martinez and Sergeant Canales, also exited the building on the west side, then moved to the south side of the building where he began helping to clear classrooms 
in waiting for specialized teams to arrive. After the initial shock of taking gunfire, Lieutenant Martinez returned south back down the hallway. Following active shooter training, he began to advance again on rooms 111 and 112 in an evident desire to maintain momentum and say to stop the killing, that's in quotes. But by this time, no other officers followed him. Several law enforcement officers suggested to the committee that if officers had followed him as backup, Lieutenant Martinez might have been made it back to the classroom doors and engaged at that time. Later, he helped to evacuate children from classrooms and moved to the south side of the building and ultimately as part of the stack of officers on the, that side of the hallway where Bortak finally breached the classrooms. Pausing here, that's the piece that we read in the last segment. Back to the report, the school surveillance cameras installed when the north-south hallway intersects the east-west hallway at the north end of the building captured the moment and activity of law enforcement officers on the north side of the building. From their perspective, the period from 11.37 a.m. when Lieutenant Martinez, Sergeant Canales, and Officer Landry made their retreat from the attacker's initial gunfire to the 12.50 p.m. when a Bortak-led stack finally made an entry into the classrooms, saw the movement of dozens of police officers from a variety of law enforcement agencies in and out of the North Hallway, positioning and preparing themselves for the eventual breaching effort. This is the video we've talked about before. This is the 77 minutes of video that has been widely released. At first, responders from the Uvalde Police Department, including the active chief of police on that day, Lieutenant Mariano Paragas, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing this name, dominated the north end of the building. By the way, that individual, uh, Lieutenant Mariano Paragas, has also been now placed on administrative leave. Lieutenant Paragas, who was one of the earliest responders, testified that he was never in communication with Chief Arandondo and that he was unaware of any communication with law enforcement officers on the south side of the building. That's the first section we read to you. He told the committee he figured that Chief Arandondo had jurisdiction over the incident and that he must have been coordinating the law enforcement response and that the Uvalde police were there to assist. He did not coordinate with any of the other agencies that responded, such as the Uvalde Sheriff's Office, the Department of Public Safety. Lieutenant Pragas did receive a phone call from the chief of the Uvalde police, who was out of town on vacation, <laughs> who called to tell him to set up a command post right away. Lieutenant Pragas testified that he went to the back of the funeral home to start a command post, that the funeral home provided an office, and that he went back outside to try to help with what was going on. This did not result in the establishment of an effective command post. Lieutenant Progress was presented present when the Uvalde CISD, that's Consolidated Independent School District, uh, that's who Chief Arandondo's over, Officer Ruben Ruiz entered through the west door and stated, she says she is shot. We're going to pause here. Ruben Ruiz is the officer that's been in the widely circulated photo who is looking at his phone, the one with the Punisher logo. It's his wife, one of the teachers who was shot. He was in communication with her. He knew that she had been shot. That is the context of those images of him looking at his phone. We'll come back to this later if we have time. Officer Ruiz was escorted away from the building. Lieutenant Pragas was also testified he heard on the radio about 9-11 calls that had come from inside the classroom. And he told the committee that it was his understanding that officers on the north side of the building understood that there were victims trapped in the classrooms with the attacker. According to Lieutenant Pragas, while nobody said it, the officers on the north side of the building were waiting for other personnel to arrive from the public department of safety or BORTAC, which would be better equipped like rifle rated shields. As responders continued to arrive on the scene, officers stationed outside the building directed them to assist in the perimeter. Special Agent Luke Williams of the Department of Public Safety testified that upon his arrival, he disregarded a request that he assist at the perimeter and instead he proceeded to the east door in the north side of the building. He began to clear rooms along the north hallway and found students hiding in the boys' restroom. The students had his legs up so as not to be seen in a stall, as he had been trained to do. Good for this kid paying attention. And he demanded that Special Agent Williams confirm he was with law enforcement, which he did by showing his badge under the stall. Way to go for this kid knowing what to do in situational awareness. They need to teach what this kid did to everybody. A special agent Williams then approached the intersection of the hallway from the east where a group of officers was positioned and the west side intersection with the weapons pointed to the south. He heard somebody say, y'all don't know if there's kids in there. Special agent Williams interjected, if there's kids in there, we need to go in there. That's a direct quote. Any officer who had been positioned in the hallway responded to special agent Williams that whoever was in charge would figure that out. Boy, we're developing a theme here, folks. Another officer pointed 
out to him that his position on the east side of the intersection was creating a crossfire situation relative to the group of officers pointing their weapons towards rooms 111 and 112 when the South Special Agent Williams departed to continue clearing other classrooms. Between 1152 and 1221, remember the breach happens at 1225, the surveillance video shows four different ballistic shields arriving at the building. Importantly, only the last shield furnished by the U.S. Marshals was rifle rated. The committee heard evidence that the rifle rated shield was the only one that would have provided meaningful protection to the officers against the attacker's AR-15 rifle. The committee received no evidence that anyone told Chief Avendano or anyone else on the south side of the building about the arrival of the rifle related shield. Just before 12.30 p.m., there was a burst of activity on the north side. A group of officers moved past the position previously established at the north end of the intersection, and they began to establish a stack close to the north side of rooms 111 and 112. Fused from the south, Corn Sergeant Coronado announced the arrival of BORTAC. Another group of officers began to stage medical triage on the east side of the north hallway. This indicates that BORTAC had lightly, likely assumed tactical command of the incident at this time, which they would have done before entering the room. BORTAC Acting Commander Paul Guerrero came to the north side of the building upon his arrival at Robb Elementary. In the post-incident statement, he said he was advised that, quote, that the subject was possibly shot multiple children was still in the classroom, end quote. He questioned surveillance throughout the black, black. He questioned, he requested surveillance through the back windows of room 111 and 112 to possibly deploy gas as they entered. He may, is made aware of receiving a Halligan tool from his car. The school surveillance camera showed the arrival of a Halligan tool, breaching tool at 1235 p.m., the committee received no evidence that the arrival of the breaching tool was ever communicated to Chief Arandondo or anyone else on the south side of the building. According to a statement, Commander Guerrero attempted to pry open the door in the hallway to see if the Halligan tool would work. He determined it would take too long and would dangerously expose an officer to gunfire. He observed the classroom door had multiple holes consisting with bullet holes, and he did not want to expose or jeopardize the safety or lives of his officers trying to pry the door open. Commander Guerrero then obtained a master key from the office of the scene. We're going to take a quick break here. Commander Guerrero is going to continue to try the doors. Then we're going to have the actual breaching of the doors. We are reading directly from the Uvalde Rob Elementary report. We're reading it verbatim without further comment, and we will continue to do so on her tell right after this. back to Hertel, we're continuing to read from the Rob Elementary Report. We're reading it verbatim. This is information for you to process, for you to decide for yourself. Please read the entire report. It is available, and we have linked to it at ordinary-times.com. Other outlets have it as well, as well as the 77-minute video, which depicts a lot of what we're describing. We're continuing to read. We are picking up where the commander of the BORTAC team uh, is starting to try to get into the classroom. Commander Guerrero, uh, then obtained a master key from the office at the scene. As he made his way to the classroom door, an officer advised him to try it on another door first. He attempted to open another door along the hallway, and it did not work. He saw a few Border Patrol agents and advised them to start setting up for a triage situation of mass casualties. He then received a second master key, which he successfully used to open another door. Working with the Borac team, BORTAC team, Commander Guerrero and another agent used the rifle-rated ballistic shield to give him cover as he opened the classroom door. Commander Guerrero placed the key in the room to door 111 and opened the door. Colonel Guerrero's contemporary report stated that he unlocked the door, but as explained above, there's reason to question whether the door was actually locked or not. The attacker was standing in front of the closet in the corner of room 111, and he fired his rifle as the stack of officers coming through the classroom door. The officers fired on the attacker, killing him. The committee has been advised that none of the Border Patrol agents involved in opening the door were wearing activated body cameras. The report goes on to display what happened outside at this time. As mentioned in the narrative above, there were important events happening outside the north and south ends of the building, in part due to difficulty in maintaining radio communications within the building. Not everyone inside the building 
perceived all of this information. A police radio communication of unknown origin stated at 11.56 a.m., quote, it is critical for everybody to let PD take point on this, end quote. None of the witnesses interviewed by the committee indicated any knowledge of this communication above what it meant by PD taking point on this. The general consensus of witnesses interviewed by the committee was that officers on the scene either assumed that Chief Arandondo was in charge or that they could not tell that anybody was in charge of the scene described by several witnesses as chaos or a, quote, cluster. There was a series of phone calls with a student inside room 112 initiated by the student calling 911 at 1203. Radio traffic communicated to those officers who could hear it that, in fact, a student had called from within the classroom. Several witnesses indicated that they were aware of this, but not Chief Arandondo. The committee has received no evidence that any officers who did learn about the phone calls coming from room 111 and 112 acted on it to advocate shifting to an active shooter style response or otherwise activating a more urgently need to breach the classroom. The heading of this section, what didn't happen in those 73 minutes. Reading from the report, a major error in the law enforcement response at Robb Elementary School was the failure of any officer to assume and exercise effective incident command. Uvalde police officers responding to a vehicle wreck and shots fired appeared to have arrived first on the scene, which would make them one of the initial commanders. Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District Police Chief Arndondo quickly arrived as the incident moved as the law enforcement response evolved. This made him a natural person to assume command over an incident as it developed, but Chief Arandondo does not consider himself to have assumed incident command. He explained to the committee, this is a direct quote, when you're in there, you don't title yourself. I know our policy states you're the incident commander. My approach and thought was responding as a police officer, and so I didn't title myself. But once I got in there and we took the fire, back then I realized we need some things. When I've got to get in that door, we needed an extraction tool. We needed those keys as far as I'm talking about the command part. The people that went in, there was a big group of them outside the door. I have no idea who they were and how they were walking in or anything of that kind. I wasn't given that direction. There's a break in the commentary here, but this is still a quote. You can always hope and pray that there's an incident command post outside. I just didn't have access to that. I don't know anything about that. It's a direct quote from Aaron Dondo. Other people, continuing with the report, other people could have assumed command, including the next people, the Uvalde's CISD pre-assigned line of command for active shooter response or others on the scene with more experience or training. Alert training teaches that any law enforcement officer can assume command, that someone must assume command, and that the incident commander can transfer responsibility as the incident develops. That did not happen at Robb Elementary, and the lack of effective incident command is a major factor that caused other vital measures to be left undone. Again, we're reading from the Uvalde uh, school shooting report, the Rob Elementary report from the Texas Legislative Committee. We're reading it verbatim here. That did not happen at Rob Elementary, and the lack of effective incident command is a major factor that caused other vital measures to be left undone. Also, the misinformation reported to the officers on the outside likely prevented some of them from taking more active role. For example, Many officers were told to stay out of the building because Chief Arandondo was inside a room with the attacker actively negotiating, which we know was not true. Responders did not remain focused on the task of, quote, stopping the killing as instructed by active shooter training. They never attempted to breach the classroom before Bortak accomplished the entry. Chief Arandondo explained, this is a direct quote again, I knew those doors, those doors open outward. They're thick, heavy doors with a metal frame. Most people are used to, as police officers, you're going to resident you kick in the doors that just was a common thing in our business you don't have that option here i knew that a ramrod which i call a buddy which is you know the heavy pipe with two handles that wasn't going to work and that's why we were calling for an extraction tool and keys back to the report but nobody ever checked the doors of room 111 or 112 to confirm they were actually locked or secured room 111 probably was not chief arndondo's search for a key consumed his attention and wasted precious time delaying the breach of the classroom Nobody called Principal Gutierrez to ask about the location of a master key. She had a key, and the head custodian had a key, both on site. Yet despite all the efforts to find a key, nobody called her. Although discussed on both the south and north sides of the building, nobody ever created a diversion on the east side of the building where rooms 111 and 112 had windows. 
and although it should not have been proved necessary had responders remained focused on, quote, stopping the killing as soon as possible, as the incident dragged on, nobody tasked any law enforcement officer to establish reliable communication between the south and north sides of the building and with the resources outside the building. Radio communication was ineffective, so someone else was needed for decision-making to receive critical information, such as the fact that the victims had called from within the rooms with the attackers. To the extent that there was confusion among officers about whether the scenario was an active shooter or a barricaded subject, information that there were wounded victims in the rooms would have clarified the existence of an active shooter scenario. In total, 376 law enforcement officers responded to the tragedy at Robb Elementary School. There's a breakdown here. We will skip that. You can read it for yourself. Continuing with the report, the committee's chief goal from the very beginning has been to provide accurate information from dependable sources. The public's need for the accurate information only has intensified as we have investigated the facts surrounding the tragedy. Problems with the flow of information have plagued government media and public discussion about what has happened at Robb Elementary from the outset, damaging public trust, inflicting a very real toll on the people of Uvalde, and creating imperative to provide a reliable set of facts. We will continue to read from the Uvalde report of the Robb Elementary School shooting right after this on Herd Tell. Back to Hertel, we continue to read from the Rob Elementary Report, the Texas Legislative Committee's report on the Uvalde school shooting. We have reached the part of the report now. We're skipping around a little bit for time and context. These are the factual conclusions of the committee. This is page 73 of the PDF 78 of the actual document. Reading from the report. Based on the foregoing information developed through its investigation, the committee has drawn the following preliminary conclusions. Uvalde, CISD, and Robb Elementary. Communication and lockdown alerts. Poor Wi-Fi connectivity in Robb Elementary likely delayed the lockdown alert through the Raptor application. Once the alert was sent, not all teachers received it immediately for a variety of reasons, including bad Wi-Fi coverage, whether the teacher used the Raptor phone application as it logged through the web browser, and whether the teacher was carrying a phone at the time. No one used the school's intercom as another means of communicating the lockdown. As a result, not all teachers received timely notification of the lockdown, including the teacher in room 111. The frequency of less serious bailout-related alerts in the Uvalde diluted the significance of the alert and tampered everyone's steadiness to act on alerts. In response to the May 24, 2020 lockdown alert at May Robb Elementary, the initial reactions of many administrators, teachers, and law enforcement responders that it was likely a less dangerous bailout. Robb Elementary had a, securing pro a reoccurring problem with maintaining its doors and locks. In particular, the locking mechanism on room 111 was widely known to be faulty, yet was never repaired. The Robb Elementary principal, her assistant responsible for entering maintenance work orders, the teacher in room 111, other teachers in the fourth grade building, and even many fourth grade students widely knew of the problems with the locks on the door to room 111. Nevertheless, no one placed a work order to repair the lock, not the principal, the secretary, the teacher, the room 111, or anyone else. Rob Elementary School had a culture of noncompliance with safety policies, requiring doors to be kept locked, which turned out to be fatal. Teachers at Rob Elementary often used rocks to prop open the exterior doors. The west door to the west building was supposed to be continuously locked. When the attacker approached on May 24th, 2022, it was unlocked and he was able to enter the building there. If the door had been locked as policy required, the attacker likely would have been slowed for some period of time as he either circumnavigated the, vet, the lock or moved to another point of entry in the building. Teachers at Robb Elementary commonly left interior doors unlocked for convenience, and they also used magnets and other methods to circumvent door locks. The doors to room 111 and 112 were required to be locked at all times, and in the lockdown, the teachers were supposed to check that they were locked. A teacher in room 112 was seen locking her classroom door after the lockdown alert. 
the door to room 111 probably was not locked. The teacher in room 111 does not recall hearing the lockdown alert. The door re required special effort to lock it. As previously noted, there was a maintenance issue and the teacher has no memory of locking the door. The attacker apparently didn't have to take any action to overcome a locked door before entering the classroom. If the door to room 111 had been locked, the attacker likely would have been slowed for some time as he either circumvented the lock or took some other alternate course of action. The attacker had an unstable, this is information about the attacker now. The attacker had an unstable home life with no father figure and a mother struggling with a substance abuse disorder. The attacker's family moved often and lived in relative poverty. The attacker developed sociopathic and violent tendencies, but he received no mental health assistance. Various members of the attacker's family were aware during the time leading up to the attacker's 18th birthday that he was estranged from his mother and that he had asked for help in buying guns through straw purchases that would have been illegal. Family members uniformly refused to buy guns for him. During the week before, between his 18th birthday and the events of May 24, 2022, the attacker expressed suicidal ide identations to a cousin who talked to him and did not believe he was an imminent suicide risk. During the week between his 18th birthday and the events of May 24th, the attacker's grandparents and other family members became aware of the attacker had bought guns. The grandparents demanded that the guns be removed from their home. The attacker struggled academically throughout his time in school. The school made no meaningful intervention with the attacker before he was involuntarily withdrawn for poor academic performance and excessive absences. The attacker had few disciplinary issues at school, but he was suspected once for a fight. Due to his excessive absences, there apparently was no information actually known to the school district that he should have been identified this attacker as a threat to any school campus. Law enforcement, there is no information actually known to local Uvalde law enforcement that should have identified this attacker as a threat to any school campus before the May 24, 2022 shootings. Some of the attacker's social media contacts received messages from the attacker related to the gun suggesting that he was going to do something they would hear about in the news and even referring to attacking a school. Reports suggest that some social media users may have repeated and reported the attacker's threatening behavior to the relevant social media platforms. The social media platforms appear to have done nothing um, to respond to the restrict the attacker's social media access or report his behavior to law enforcement authorities. The services used by Uvalde's Consolidated Independent School District to monitor social media for threats did not provide any alert of threatening behavior by the attacker. There was no legal impediment to the attacker buying the two AR-15 style rifles, 60 magazines, and 2,000 rounds of ammunition when he turned 18. The ATF was not required to notify local sheriffs of the multiple purchases. We're going to take another break here on Herd Tell. Again, we're reading from the Rob Elementary Report from the Texas Legislative Committee, the Uvalde school shooting. We're reading it verbatim. We're just giving you the raw information. That's how we're going to turn down the noise on this very tough issue. When we come back, we're going to finish up by the law enforcement responses, the conclusions that the committee drew. It's some damning stuff. It's hard to read, but we must bear witness to this. More from the Uvalde school shooting special report on Herd Tell right after this. Welcome back to Herd Tell. Uh, we've reached the part of the report that is uh, the conclusions of the committee that investigated and the law enforcement response from the report. There was no law enforcement officer on the Robb Elementary campus when the attacker came over the fence and towards the school. Citizens at this scene quickly alerted law enforcement about a vehicle accident, a man with a gun, and shots fired near the Robb Elementary campus. As initially reported by Uvalde Police Dispatch and understood by most initial responders, the incident began off campus as one would have been in the jurisdiction of the Uvalde Police Department. Uvalde police officers were among the first, if not the first, law enforcement respondents on the scene as a man firing a gun moved towards Robb Elementary School. As the situation developed and responders received more information, it became apparent that the threat moved onto the school campus and within the jurisdiction of the Uvalde Consolidated Independent School District Police Department. 
Multiple law enforcement officers arrived at Rob Elementary within a few minutes of the attacker coming over the fence. As Uvalde Police Department officers saw a person dressed in black and thought it might have been the attacker. From a distance of over 100 yards, that officer requested permission to shoot. Subsequent analysis suggested that the person in black was a school coach and the officer did not have an opportunity to stop the attacker by shooting him before entering the west of the building. Wow. Rob Elementary School coach Yvette Silva acted heroically and almost certainly saved lives by alerting the school to the attacker's advance. Most fourth grade classes successfully locked down as a result of her quick response. After entering through the unlocked west door that we've already talked about, the attacker had about three minutes in the west building before first responders arrived at the building including approaching two and a half minutes during which the attacker is estimated to have fired over a hundred rounds of ammunition. The initial responders to the West building heard gunfire and encountered a hallway with a fog of drywall debris, bullet holes, and empty rifle casings. They converged on rooms 111 and 112, which they identified as the location of the attacker. They acted appropriately by attempting to breach the classroom and stop the attacker. The attacker immediately repelled them with a burst of rifle fire from inside the classroom. Pausing here. This is the video. This is the point where you see them running back down the hallway and taking up a position back. That's what just happened was the shooter taking shots at them. The responders immediately began to assess options to breach the classroom, but they lost critical momentum by treating the scenario as a, quote, barricaded subject instead of with the greater urgency attached to the active shooter scenario. It actually was an active shooter scenario because the attacker was preventing critically injured and wounded people from getting out and getting medical attention. An active shooter scenario differs from the barricaded subject scenario in what law enforcement officers respond to the active shooters are trained to prioritize the safety of the innocent victims over the safety of law enforcement responders. At first, the first responders did not have reliable evidence about whether they were injured victims inside rooms 111 and 112 although circumstantial evidence strongly suggests that the possibility, including the fact that the attackers had fired many rounds inside the classrooms at the time when students were in attendance. The alert training, quote, reliable evidence standard does not align with the reasonable officer standard applied to alert in its preliminary and partial report to the Robb Elementary shooting. Uvalde's Consolidated Independent School District active shooter policy called for Uvalde to Consolidated Independent School District Police Chief Arandondo to be the incident commando if an active shooter responds. Chief Arandondo was one of the first responders to arrive at the West Building. In the initial response to the incident, Chief Arandondo was actively engaged in the effort to stop the killing. That's a quote up to the point when he was the attacker was located in room 111, 112, and the attacker fired on the responding officers. By this time, there were dozens of officers on the scene, but Chief Arndondo did not assume his prearranged responsibility of incident command, which would have entailed informing other officers that he was in command and also leave the building to exercise command, beginning with establishing an incident command post. Instead, he remained in the hallway where he lacked reliable communication with other elements of law enforcement, and he was unable to effectively implement staging or command or control of the situation. Over the course of the next hour, hundreds of law enforcement officials arrived on the scene, 376 of them we now know. The scene was chaotic without any person obviously in charge or directing the law enforcement responses. To the extent any officers considered Chief Arandondo to be the overall incident commander, they also would have recognized that he was inconsistent with him remaining inside the building. They were an overall lackadaisical approach by law enforcement at this scene. For many, this was because they were given and relied upon inaccurate information. For others, they had enough information to know better. Despite obvious deficiencies in command and control of the scene, which should have been recognized by other law enforcement responders, none approached Chief Orondondo or any other officer around him subordinate to him to affirmatively offer assistance with incident command. Chief Orondondo and the officers around him at the south end of the building were focused on gaining access to the classroom and protective equipment for the officers. Meanwhile, dozens of law enforcement officers were assembling in the hallway to the north of the building, stacking up for an assault on the classrooms, and most waiting for further instructions pending the arrival of protective gear and equipment. While 9-11 received communication from victims inside rooms 111 and 112, Chief Arandondo did not learn about it because of his failure to establish a reliable method of receiving critical information from outside the building. 
Eventually, Chief Arndondo came to the understanding there probably were casualties in room 11 and 112. Even if he had received information, surviving injured victims in the classroom it is unclear that he would have done anything differently to act, quote, more urgently. U.S. Marshals provided a rifle-related shield, rifle-rated shield, and it arrived at 1220, approximately 30 minutes before the classroom was finally breached. While officers acted on the assumption that, room, that the doors to rooms 111 and 112 were locked, as they were designed to be, nobody ever tested that assumption. Room 111's door probably was not effectively locked shut, both for maintenance reasons and because nobody ever locked it. Chief Arndondo did not actually exercise tactical incident command over the BORTAC team, nor did the BORTAC team seek instruction from Chief Arndondo. By the time the BORTAC team breached the classroom, the tactical command inside the building had de facto been assumed by BORTAC. Acting on effectively the same information available to Chief Arndondo, including an assumption of injured victims, the BORTAC commander on the scene waited until arranging a rifle-rated shield and obtaining a working master key before attempting to breach the classrooms. The committee has not received medical evidence that would inform them of the judgment about whether the breaching of the classroom sooner than the approximate 73 minutes that passed between the first responders' initial arrival on the west of the building and the eventual breach of the classroom could have saved the lives or mitigated injuries. As described above, it is likely that most of the deceased victims perished immediately during the attacker's burst of gunfire. However, given the information known about the victims who survived through the time of the breach and who later died on the way to the hospital, it is plausible that some of the victims could have survived if they had not had to wait 73 minutes for the rescue. You're listening to Her Tell. We're reading the Rob Elementary School Report verbatim. We need a break. We'll be right back to wrap up the show right after this. Welcome back to Herd Tell. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you for sticking with us on this very different and difficult edition of Herd Tell. We have read most and a lot of the important portions of the Robb Elementary School report from the Texas Legislative Committee. We have linked to it. Ordinary Dash Times has it in its entirety. It's in a PDF format. Please read the entire report for yourself. This is our core principle here. We turn down the noise. We get to the information. We've been highly critical of the response here, so it's only fair that we read this verbatim with very little additional commentary other than context of what we were reading. Decide for yourself what was happening here with the information we now have. So wherever you and yours are, we hope you will read this full report, and we hope you will not let go of the issues here, because issues in police departments are usually universal. Issues in school systems are usually universal because they're people problems, not systemic failures, although that is what happened here. Do not let systemic failure mean nobody actually gets held accountable because everybody was wrong, because that's how we wind up with more and more of these. Wherever you are, we hope you and yours are well. We hope you're well fed. Thank you for sticking with us on this special edition of Hertel. We'll talk to you next time. All the music on Hertel is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com.